we will teach you how to analyse Orwell's literary techniques and how to unpack his complex ideas so that you'll be ready to write awesome essays about how human experiences are represented in 1984. So, get ready to conquer HSC English. In this lesson, we'll start by briefly explaining Section 2 of your Paper 1 HSC exam. In this section of the paper, you'll be asked to showcase your understanding of how 1984 represents ideas from the Texts and Human Experiences module. You will be asked one question worth 20 marks, requiring a sustained response about 1984. You will have 45 minutes to complete your response. There are a few different types of questions you need to be prepared for. For example, the question might be specific to the form of the novel. That means you'll need to be familiar with Orwell's main literary techniques and the overall structure of the novel. You may also be asked a question specific to the text itself, perhaps a theme or human experience found in the novel. Alternatively, you could also be required to respond to a stimulus, like a statement drawn from the module. That means you need to be familiar with all the main ideas in the Texts and Human Experiences rubric. If you need a refresher on the Texts and Human Experiences rubric, flick back to our series of lessons that focus on breaking down and understanding the key aspects of the rubric. To be successful in Paper 1, Section 2, you need to be able to adapt your knowledge of the novel to answer whatever question they throw at you. This means you need to know the rubric and your text thoroughly. Not an easy job, but we're here to help. These lessons will help you prepare for a wide variety of essay questions that could appear in the exam. Together, we'll go through the main ideas in the novel that relate to human experiences, unpacking key techniques and quotes as we go. Be sure to check out part two, where we will analyse more key ideas from the module. If you would like a little more help with essay writing, check out our lessons on building paragraphs for 1984. Let's get started. First, let's figure out how the novel represents individual and collective human experiences. Orwell's decision to write the novel using third-person subjective narration gives us access to the protagonist's thoughts and feelings and a privileged view into the life of Winston Smith. His individual experiences in the dystopian world of 1984 are revealed to us through the narration. We read about his private thoughts and feelings that make up his subjective or personal view of the world. This would be an important point to raise if you were asked a question in Paper 1, Section 2, that focused on the novel's form. Thinking back to our lessons on the Texts and Human Experiences rubric, we know that individual experiences are situations and events that happen to one person and shape who they are. They include things like secrets. Let's look at how secrets are represented in 1984. In the opening chapter of the novel, Orwell introduces Winston's dangerous secret, his diary. Orwell uses the secret diary as a plot device to express Winston's suppressed hatred for the party and Big Brother. A plot device is an object or character that helps move the plot forward. Winston expresses himself on the page because it's not safe to talk to anyone in case they're a spy. Opening the diary for the first time is both pleasurable and terrifying for Winston because it was a peculiarly beautiful book. But, if detected, it was reasonably certain that it would be punished by death. The juxtaposition, where the two opposing ideas of beauty and danger are placed side by side, heightens the thrill of this personal experience. Orwell also shows us what Winston writes in his diary. They'll shoot me. I don't care. They'll shoot me in the back of the neck. I don't care. Down with Big Brother. They always shoot you in the back of the neck. I don't care. Down with Big Brother. 
Winston blurts out his thoughts and feelings in a continuous flow known as stream of consciousness. Orwell often allows Winston to take over the narration, also known as internal narration, to bring us even closer to Winston. Again, this would be good to point out if you had a question on form. Notice how this also creates an individual experience for the reader? Do you feel drawn into Winston's personal experience? Are you excited by his rebellion and a bit scared about the consequences? That's because Winston is not the only one who is meant to have all the fun. The rubric wants us to reflect personally on the human behaviour we observe in texts. Come to think of it, so did George Orwell. Without us, he can't fulfil his political purpose of writing this important novel in the first place. Can you think of any other individual experiences we encounter through the narration? Consider things like Winston's memories of his family, his dreams, his identity struggle as a member of a party he hates, his fiery passion for Julia, his talent with words and enjoyment of his work. You could even look at Winston's individual experience of torture and utter defeat at the hands of O'Brien. Take some time now to jot down any other individual experiences you notice Winston has in the novel. Then, look at the passages in the novel that describe those experiences. Really narrow it down to specific sentences or phrases. Next, Analyse the language Orwell uses to represent that experience, like we just did for Winston's diary. Finally, reflect on how those individual experiences might mirror your own or other people's in the real world. This may lead you to some conclusions about Orwell's purpose. You may also consider how these fictional experiences help us make sense of our own real experiences in the world. Maybe you're secretly planning a rebellion. If so, good luck. Hopefully you don't end up like Winston. Now let's take a look at how collective experience is represented in the novel. These are situations and events that are shared by groups, including nations and cultures. They include historical and political events, like war, one of the ways Orwell represents the collective experience of war is by manipulating the form of the novel. He uses narrative framing, or a text within a text, to dive deep into the political, economic, social and psychological impacts of continuous warfare. It is a more elegant way of conveying information to the reader, as opposed to awkwardly dumping it all in the narration or dialogue. In part two, Winston takes over the narration and reads extracts from A Forbidden Book, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism by Emmanuel Goldstein. It is a work of fiction made up by Orwell, but it is real for Winston. Orwell uses this forbidden book to depict war as an ongoing situation that keeps the population stupefied by poverty. In the early 20th century, war was experienced by the masses as a desperate, annihilating struggle. However, in the new dystopian world of 1984, war is used to eat up materials which might otherwise be used to make the masses too comfortable and hence too intelligent. As a result, modern society is more like that of a besieged city where the possession of a lump of horse flesh makes the difference between wealth or poverty. In terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is explained in Lesson 1 of our Text and Human Experiences rubric series, the new purpose of continuous warfare is to prevent people from self actualization which would undermine the status of the party. The population are too worried about covering their basic physiological needs to even think about other needs like love and self-esteem. The party has designed the society this way to keep people poor, confused, frightened and under control. 
If we take a moment to consider Orwell's portrayal of war, we might make some real-world connections. Perhaps our assumptions about the way war is waged might be challenged. Can you think of any past examples of wars that were deliberately started for purely economic reasons? A little bit of research would shed some light on this. Perhaps Orwell is criticising real governments for their dishonesty and greed. What do you think? There are also a number of other examples of collective human experiences in the novel. Situations like oppression, poverty, the constant surveillance and nationalistic hysteria. There are also shared events like the two minutes hate. Take some time now to jot down any other examples you can think of. Find the relevant passages, analyse the language, and then personally reflect on those examples. How might they relate to your own or others' experiences in the real world? Let's move on now to how the text represents human qualities and emotions associated with or arising from these experiences. Remember, human qualities are established patterns of behaviour, thought and emotion that come to define who we are. They are the attributes that make up our personalities, but they aren't fixed. Our qualities may change as a result of our, you guessed it, experiences. Emotions are individual feelings that come and go. Our emotions can impact on our experiences, but experiences can also trigger emotions. Take the first example we looked at, Winston's diary. Winston's experience of writing in his secret diary for the first time is accompanied by a physiological response. A tremor had gone through his bowels. This sensory imagery that describes the sensations in Winston's body depicts a physical response to an intense emotion. If we think about Robert Pluchik's emotional colour wheel, which is explained in Lesson 2 of our Texts and Human Experiences rubric series, Winston has graduated from his daily sense of apprehension to a moment of intense fear, maybe even borderline terror. Instead of telling us that Winston is afraid as a result of this experience, he shows us by describing this physiological response. This is good writing. We can empathise with Winston because most of us have felt that tremor of fear at some point in our lives. Can you think of any other examples of Winston's physiological responses to intense emotion? How about when his entrails seem to grow cold during the horrifying experience of the two minutes hate? His passionate experiences with Julia make him feel as though a fire were burning in his belly. When he experiences a dream about his mother, he wakes up with his eyes full of tears. When Winston realises that he and Julia are about to be arrested, his entrails turned into ice. Have a look over these examples of sensory imagery again. Connect them to the emotions they represent and to the experiences Winston has. Let's take a closer look now at some of Winston's human qualities associated with his experiences. Let's look at his childhood experiences. Winston's innate selfishness often soured his interactions with his mother and sister. This is demonstrated in the novel by an ellipsis, or flashback, to his childhood. In part two, the narration describes a vivid dream that is actually a memory. As a child, Winston would shout and storm at his mother for more food or attempt a snivelling note of pathos in his efforts to get more than his share. When the chocolate ration arrived, he was given three quarters of the block, while his little sister only received a tiny piece. However, he had snatched the piece of chocolate out of his sister's hand. He later feels deep regret over this, but this analepsis provides useful background to Winston's human qualities. It also foreshadows, or hints at, Winston's final 
catastrophic act of selfishness at the climax of the novel. Another good example is the character of O'Brien. He's a real doozy. His human qualities of Machiavellianism, narcissism and psychopathy, known as the Dark Triad, are associated with his experience of torturing Winston in part three of the novel. Have a look at some of O'Brien's monologues or extended speeches in part three, chapters two and three. Identify and analyse some key sentences or phrases that represent his dark triad of human qualities. There's a lot to choose from. Let's not forget that human qualities also arise from experiences. That means we can gain new qualities or personality traits as a result of our experiences. Consider the oppressive atmosphere of London in 1984. The party have grown so powerful that they can use surveillance technology to monitor every citizen. This has resulted in Winston becoming quite an anxious and paranoid person. Look at the tone or emotion of anxiety in the narration. You had to live, did live, from habit that became instinct, in the assumption that every sound you made was overheard and except in darkness every movement scrutinised. That's enough to put anyone on edge. Winston is also anxious around children because hardly a week passed in which The Times did not carry a photograph describing how some eavesdropping little sneak had overheard some compromising remark and denounced his parents to the thought police. From these examples, we can see how Winston's experiences of oppression and constant surveillance have resulted in him acquiring the traits of anxiety, evasiveness and antisocial paranoia. We can also imagine how we would feel if we were placed in a similar environment. It would be enough to turn even the most optimistic person into a nervous wreck. Great job. We've just explored some fundamental ideas from the texts and human experiences rubric and analysed how they're depicted in 1984. Now you know all about how the novel represents individual and collective experiences and how human qualities and emotions are associated with or arise from these experiences. Soon, you'll be ready to incorporate these ideas into sophisticated essays. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.